7th of January, 2009. Slingshots versus white phosphorus bombs. Take some kittens, some tender little mogis in a box, said Jamal, a surgeon at El Shifa, Gaza's main hospital, while a nurse actually placed a couple of blood-stained cardboard boxes in front of us. Seal it up, then jump on it with all your weight and might until you feel their little bones crunching and you hear the last muffled little mew. I stared at the boxes in astonishment, and the doctor continued. Try to imagine what would happen after such images were circulated. The righteous outrage of public opinion, the complaints of the animal rights organizations. The doctor went on in this vein, and I was unable to take my eyes off the boxes at our feet. Israel trapped hundreds of civilians inside a school, as if in a box including many children, and then crunched them with all the might of its bombs. What were the world's reactions? Almost nothing. We would have been better off as animals rather than Palestinians. We would have been better protected. At this point, the doctor leans towards one of the boxes and takes its lid off in front of me. Inside it are the amputated limbs, legs, and arms some from the knee down, others with the entire femur attached, from amputees injured at Al Fakhura United Nations School in Jabalia, which resulted in more than 50 casualties. Pretending to be taken an urgent call, I took my leave of Jamal, actually rushing to the bathroom to throw up. A little earlier, I'd been involved in a conversation with Dr. Abdel, an ophthalmologist, regarding the rumors that the Israeli army had been showering us with non-conventional weapons, forbidden by the Geneva Conventions, such as cluster bombs and white phosphorus. The very same that the Israeli army used during the last Lebanese war, as well as the U.S. Air Force in Fallujah, in violation of international norms. In front of Al-Auda Hospital, we witnessed and filmed white phosphorus bombs being used about 500 meters from where we stood too far away to be absolutely certain there were any civilians under the Israeli Apaches, but so terribly close all the same. The Geneva Treaty of 1980 forbids white phosphorus being used directly as a war weapon in civilian areas, allowing it only as a smoke screen or for lighting. There's no doubt that using this weapon in Gaza, a strip of land concentrating the highest population rate in the world, is a crime all on its own. Dr. Abdel told me that at Al Shifa Hospital, they don't have the medical and military competence to say for sure whether the wounds they examined on certain corpses were indeed caused by illegal weapons. But he gave his word that, in 20 years on the job, he had never seen casualties like these that were now being carried into the ward. He told me about the traumas to the skull with fractures to the vomer bone, the jaw, the cheekbones, the tear ducts, the nasal and palatine bones, all showing signs of the collision of an immense force against the victim's face. What he finds inexplicable is the total lack of eyeballs, which ought to leave a trace somewhere within the skull, even with such a violent impact. Instead, we see Palestinian corpses coming into the hospitals without any eyes at all, as if someone had removed them surgically before handing them over to the coroner. Israel has let us know that we've been generously granted a three-hour daily ceasefire from 1 to 4 p.m. These statements from the Israeli military leadership are considered by the people of Gaza as having the same reliability as the Hamas leaders' declarations that they've just provoked a massacre of enemy soldiers. Just to be clear on this point, Tel Aviv's worst enemy is the very same that fights under the Star of David. Yesterday, a warship off the coast of Gaza's port picked out a large group of alleged guerrilla fighters from the Palestinian resistance, moving as a united front around Jabalia. They shot their cannons at them, but as it turned out, they were their own fellow soldiers, with the shooting resulting in three being killed and about 20 injured. No one here believes in the ceasefires that Israel calls. And as it happens, today at 2 p.m., Rafah was under attack by Israeli helicopters. 
there was also yet another massacre of children in Jabalia. Three little sisters, aged two, four, and six, from the Abd Rabbu family were slaughtered. Just half an hour earlier in Jabalia, once again the Red Crescent Hospital's ambulances were under attack. Eva and Alberto, my ISM companions, were on board that ambulance and managed to film everything, passing those videos and photos on to all the major media. Hassan was kneecapped, fresh from mourning the death of his friend Arif, a paramedic who was killed two days ago as he was going in aid of the injured in Gaza City. They had stopped to pick up the body of a man languishing in the middle of the road when they were showered by about 10 shots from an Israeli sniper. One bullet hit Hassan in the knee and the ambulance was filled with holes. Traveling towards Al Quds Hospital, where I'll be working all night on the ambulances, I raced along on board one of the very few fearless taxi drivers left, zigzagging to avoid the bombs. And on the corner of one street, I saw a group of dirty street urchins in tattered clothes, looking exactly like the Shusha kids of the Italian post-war period. They threw stones towards the sky with slingshots, at a remote and unreachable enemy toying with their lives. This is a crazy metaphor, which could serve as a snapshot of the absurdity of this place at the moment. Stay human.